quite interesting. I actually, I, my conception of it began, I think, in 2000. So I call it boilerplate 10 year overnight success. <laughs> it's been a while. But, uh, but actually, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's really been uh, kind of an organic and slow process. So it's, uh, it's not like, um, all this, it's not like a curtain coming down. All of a sudden, I have all this stuff going on. It's uh, the end game was always the book, which I got out about three years ago, and uh, or two, actually a year and a half, year and a half ago, and it took three years to do, and uh, and then this movie deal came down the pike just at the end of last year, so um, you know, and of course in those kinds of situations, you completely sign away everything. So uh, I regarded it as. Uh, Giving your get up for adoption, but knowing it's going to a really, really good home. So I'm not, I'm not really worried about uh, sort of letting the robot off at its, at its adventure. That's great. So the movie deal, that isn't a rumor; it's real. Do you think it'll materialize, or? Yeah, um, actually, um, last at the last year, San Diego. We were we had just begun negotiations with uh, Paramount and JJ Abrams, and he was at the show uh, promoting a fringe. So he came. He uh, he was doing a signing at the Warner Entertainment, Group. and I went over to just say hi, just to meet. Him. And then um, later that day, I was at my artist alley table, and JJ came um, from a service entrance. Just a beeline to the artist alley table where I was at, and reiterated enthusiasm, commitment to the project, and left the hall. So that was tremendously flattering that he would make the effort to do that. And then, um, and then it was, it was, you know, was, he was obviously very busy, and he got very busy with spring, and they have two TV shows coming out. This fall. But uh, before this show happened, um, got in touch with him again and asked about. You know, any news that I can pass on because I knew that I'd be getting uh, the question every five minutes as to what's going on with the movie. And I was hoping to throw me some kind of bone about it. And uh, unfortunately, he didn't have specifics for it. Uh, not out of secrecy, just out of kept, um, they were in the middle of trying to figure out who they were going to attach as a screenwriter. They sent the book out to uh, a bunch of people and asked them to send them back some kind of proposal, like a sheet or two, just describing how they would approach the project. And uh, so they sent the book out, they got the responses, and now they're sitting through those responses, figuring out if it would be the best fit. Uh, so they don't have a screenwriter attached yet, and they haven't figured out a production date, just they haven't figured out a start date for production. But um, although JJ did not show up at the San Diego Con this year, uh, some representatives of his company, Bad Robot, were there. And one in particular, the head of their, I guess, visual department, there was actually the art director, uh, came by the table. And he, again, was saying that he was still on track to do it. Uh, he, he could tell that it was a good sign that uh, the book was laid out on several people's tables across the offices. And he even asked me to send him some reference photos of the model he built to Photoshop into images. That I set up here for fish, for a little bit of visual. So nothing concrete yet, but uh, as uh, as the Magic Eight Ball would say, the sign looks good. Now. Very good, very very good. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I played uh, back in 2000, and at that time, I was working for a comic publisher, so was a comic book artist, and um, I would, you know, create series, uh, I'd, I'd done, uh, uh, created a series for DC called Kronos, a time-traveling character, and I really wanted to do just straight historical adventure stories, and um, so I was pitching around this idea, uh, the idea of doing sort of an anthology series about some of the you know, greatest hits, I guess. And publishers weren't really reacting well to it uh, because of whatever traumas they had with their uh, history teachers, you know, per the perception that history is boring. And so I realized I needed some kind of book. And I was thinking about some stuff that I've enjoyed, historical, uh, uh, sort of historical fiction that I've been a big fan of. Uh, there's this author, Gore Vidal, who's done a series of uh, history, n historical novels that he calls the American Empire series, where a 
national protagonist moves through these settings and interacts with events and people. There's also the British version of that, uh, the Flashman series by George McDonald Frazier. Same kind of thing. And then uh, the most pop culture example would be the Indiana Jones television series, where, again, a fictional protagonist interacts with history, participates with it, but does not change it, and it's not an alternate history. And uh, so I used that, that as a template for, for the things I wanted to do. But I thought to, to better than using a human protagonist, which came up with a robot character, especially if that robot had particularly blank slate type of expression, that a lot more people would plug into it than if it was a particular genotype. And so uh, I started, again, I, I conceived it as a graphic novel, but I quickly realized that what I wanted to do was immerse people in this history. Uh, make them really believe that they are there and that this character is there. Uh, and I realized the way to do that was um, uh, by using photographic elements. It's sort of like doing like a hybrid graphic novel, right? Using the pages, pages. And then I would have sequences that were a series of stills, like a collage, and essentially reinforcing this idea that the comic book you're reading was based on real events. But, uh, but that didn't quite work out either, so I decided to go completely with this notion of a fake history book, like a pop history book, which you would see Time Life produce, something like that. And um, again, this is back in 2000, web comics weren't really happening then. Uh, but uh, I used what is the current web model, and that is to say that I would add content to my website every few weeks, until I had enough material to put into a collection. So that's how the website got started. As I started posting photographs of the robot superimposed into vintage images, and then uh, tell the story of those images. So for instance, the first uh, image I had in my head was the robot with Teddy Roosevelt at the top of Nampon Hill. And uh, so I, I, I mocked up that picture and then told the story of the Spanish War. And uh, when this website went up and went out there, I didn't do a lot of publicity. I sent links out to a few portals, a few websites. Like but it quickly snowballed because people thought that this was real. They started buying into this notion that this world actually existed. And it started to get uh, a lot of press. And uh, in one of those articles, the reporter asked, What's your end game with this website? And I just a coffee table book. And a publisher saw uh, that article and took me up on it. And, uh, and I, but, but even that was kind of a circuitous route because the original publisher wound up going bankrupt before I completed the book. So, uh, so I thought, oh, okay, there's another thing. It was going to be a comic, then it didn't turn out to be a comic, then it was a website, and then it was a book, but it's not going to be a book. And so there was these funny setbacks. But each one of these setbacks led to something better. So uh, the material that I, that I put together so far was this great pitch that I was able to then line up another publisher with, which was even uh, a better fit than the first publisher. And it wound up with Abrams, which is a coffee table book uh, uh, publisher in New York. It primarily does, um, you know, like landscapes or, or personality things, photo overviews. And they'd never really done a fictional thing like this. Um, but they have done art books that are similar in vibe, uh, historical overviews of particular periods. And, um, and they liked the concept. And they were going to go along with the conceit that this is supposed to be real, that boilerplate really existed. So when you pick up the book, you will find no indication, uh, no disclaimer. Uh, nothing beyond the fine print in the edition that, that, that has you know, the ownership of the image in the book is our mom. So that's the only hint that, that this is in fact a fake history. The story of um, this inventor who one of his family members was killed in combat uh, in a really senseless war. And so he vows that he's not going to have that happen to anybody else. And he's going to build a soldier to replace infantrymen in combat. Or, as it says, uh, to um, prevent the deaths of men in the conflicts of nations. And so he, he builds this prototype. But this is before World War I, when the idea of replacing the stalwart infantry with a robot is completely dishonored. I mean, where's the glory in that? 
So, uh, so the, the rubber never actually gets made. The military doesn't have to purchase them. He remains a single prototype. But the inventor is convinced that uh, that this is the solution to to work. So he continues to press uh, military the military to to include the other plates so that he can demonstrate his abilities. So boilerplate does wind up participating in the Spanish American War, and then uh, in the Philippine War because of that. And as long as they're over there, they take a little hop over to the Boxer Rebellion, and then uh, and then wind up back in the United States. Time to pursue Pancho Villa in the Peter expedition uh, from of um, of Pershing's. And then finally, World War One, where he mysteriously disappears, never to be seen again. Because I always enjoy the uh, the Amelia Earhart ending uh, in his stories for for this for this period of time. And and that's the period of time which I'm completely fascinated by because for me, it's the origin of the modern age. Not just uh, automobiles, and telephones, and airplanes, but also day-to-day -day things that you take for granted. The idea that women have the right to vote. That kids don't have to work in factories. That, uh, that you know, that, that, that live, I mean, people fought and died for the eight-hour day, and workplace safety legislation, and some you know, unemployment, and all, all the stuff that we take for granted. So I thought that this is a it's just a fascinating period, and, and also the aesthetic is really cool, uh, which I'm sure that uh, steampunks can relate to. I think that that you know all the decor and all the filigree and all the fun stuff there, and the idea that everything was mechanical. I mean, this I'm sure is um, why uh, I mean, this is part of the steampunk. I think is is, is that is that it's um, accessible. That the uh, that not only among fandom that you can make your own outfit to create your own props and stuff like that, but also the idea, the promise of a technology that doesn't require you know a leak from MIT to repair. So that so that whole period is just really fascinating for me, and um, and the and the boilerplate concept gives me an excuse to sort of play in the sandbox. So, so that's the that's the saga of uh, of boilerplate. Actually, actually, one of my one of my favorite things of um, I came up with a story. Uh, one of the most exciting things for me was um, discovering this this really esoteric uh, uh, military uh, event, uh, the Korean War of 1871. And uh, it was one of these military adventuring things that we did uh, after our success in opening up Japan, Admiral Kirby, and uh, another guy to earlier. And so we went to Korea to open up the military trip. Completely screwed up um, first contact, I guess, to speak in Star Trek terms. Completely screwed it up. And uh, we wound up uh, just going home, uh, having involved in like, a few days of combat with the Koreans. Completely overmatched, of course, and it had, you know, flintlocks to our, you know, It was pretty sad. But um, that's, uh, that event, I only stumbled across because I needed the Bruce Wayne moment for the inventor, for his family member to be killed in some kind of pointless conflict that inspired him to create a boilerplate. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, my first image of boilerplate was with Teddy Roosevelt at San Juan, it's 1898. And I'm a, I grew up in Chicago, and I've always been fascinated with the Chicago World's Fair. And at World's Fair, they would introduce new technology. So I had boilerplate being unveiled in 1893 at the Chicago Columbia Network. And so that meant that the uh, that the Bruce Wayne woman had to take place before 1893. But if you look in if you can look in any history book, the only military conflicts uh, in the mid 19th century are the Civil War and the Spanish American War. There's nothing in between that. In fact, one of the things that got the Spanish American War under the pay was that a whole generation had grown up without wars of combat. They were ready to go and fight. They started going through Navy records looking for some kind of incident in between the Civil War and the American War, and I stumbled across the Korean War of 1871. So that, in the book, in the boilerplate book, is one of my proudest things in terms of bringing to life a completely forgotten piece of history. So it's just really exciting to be able to um, to uh, share some of the some of those stories, military history terms. I see steampunk is taking place between the Civil War and World War One, and uh, uh, but not a lot of people are familiar with uh, the, uh, the dynamics. So that was another thing that was. Uh,